We are back. We're getting ready for our, technically our first panel of the day. I was gonna say second, but G was definitely more of a chat. Um, I hope y'all enjoyed the Gia's conversation. Very much empowering, exciting. My name is Trey Green, by the way, and I am, I'm All the right, founder of Black and Media. We're getting ready for our, technically our first panel of the day. I was gonna say second, but G was definitely more of a chat. Um, oh, wait. I hope y'all enjoyed. And um, I was like, what is this sound? But it was a delay. But yeah, and there is a bit of a delay too on the video, just so y'all are aware. But um, Black and Media, if this is your first time ever tuning into anything we've done, this is our first year ever doing the Black and Media Day Summit. Um, it was It's a community that I founded last summer during the, the whole moment of the media reckoning. Um, realizing that, okay, you know, all these black bylines are all over these media publications that oftentimes do not feature stories that center black folk. Um, you know, we're, we were all in the A block, the B block, the C block, the D block of news broadcasts, just stories about our trauma and everything that we're going through, things that we have been saying for decades working in the media industry. Um, for some reason, you know, and clearly because of the climate and the time and everything that was happening, uh, people and a lot of outlets wanted to listen, wanted to highlight it. Um, but for me, it wasn't enough because I said, we've been saying this. I've been in the rooms trying to stress the fact that we're not moving up. We're not in leadership positions. We're facing micro microaggressions every day at work. Um, and I also realized it was a bit of a trend. And I knew by July, which is what happened, all those bylines would slowly trickle away. You know, the reckoning passed this year with not even really any recognition of it. It just, we, we flew on by. Um, and I decided, I said, you know what? I wanna make a space that is completely devoted to black media professionals, a place that is not just about our triumph, our, tra our trauma, you know, our work trauma and all the horrible things we go through, but is also talking about the fact that we take those trash, terrible experiences, and we still create amazing content that centers Blackness, that centers Black stories, that centers Black people. We're still telling our stories through our challenges. Um, and I'll, I'll add to that, along with that, I also wanted Black and Media to have a professional development leg because I feel like in a lot of cases, uh, specifically for early career and then college students, um, there can be a bit of a disconnect. There can be a lack of resources for black people wanting to move into media um, early in their career. So I wanted to offer opportunities like the summit today and specifically this chat that we're about to have about freelancing to really let you uh, not necessarily just hone your skills, but gain resources, gain insight, learn about what you wanna do from black people in the media industry that are doing it. Um, so that was a bit of just like an overview of what black and media is. Black and media day, today, July 16th, which is also Ida B. Wells' birthday, um, the iconic investigative journalist who actually inspired me to choose July 16th for Black and Media Day. Um, there, it's more of a social media campaign and where we're just sharing things that we worked on um, and letting the world know what we already know every day we wake up as Black media professionals, that we're dope, that we make great stuff. Um, and we don't have to beg anybody to see us. That's my other big piece of what Black and Media is. It's the fact that we can celebrate ourselves and that's more than enough because we understand ourselves more than anybody can. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll make sure to share if you don't have the graphics and everything that you can post for Black and Media today, I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, and I am excited about the conversation that we're about to have about freelancing. I know this is a topic that when we've done all of our Black and Media workshops up until this point, a lot of people ask about freelancing. How do you break into it? Uh, you know, what are some tips or some tricks or just advice for me to be able to take advantage of those opportunities? Um, and I pulled together me and then Brianna Tripp, who is our amazing program manager, helped make this happen. Uh, we pulled together a great uh, a roster of, I'm gonna be unbiased, but some of my, my favorite freelancers um, who I think represent a, a, a wide swatch of what you can do and the topics that you can cover as, as a freelancer. Um, so yes, happy Black and Media Day. Thanks for tuning in. And we're gonna hop into this chat with 
Uh, we have, first of all, uh, Garrett Kennedy is our first person. Um, Miss Drea Donna, AKA Drea Rowland, the baddest. Um, Patrice Peck, who is also just phenomenal. Everybody on here is phenomenal. I could sing their praises for days. Um, we actually worked together at BuzzFeed back in the day. Um, and then the also fabulous Miss Kovey. All right. Um, another one that was BuzzFeed uh, co-worker turned very, very good friend. Um, so yes, I, just to give people an idea of what you do, we can go from Garrick, Drea, Covier, Patrice, but can you just kind of give like a brief, cause they can research you. So we don't have to do the whole biography, but can you give like a brief idea of what your freelancing, what freelancing is for you? So like what freelance work do you do? Um, maybe some outlets you've written for, um, or if, even if you have your own new newsletter or you had your own newsletter. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Garrett Kennedy. I was at the LA Times for about a decade and I left to focus on um, my second book, um, which is on Whitney Houston coming out next year. Sorry, I had to do a quick drop because I'm so proud and excited for it. Um, but I have written for um, GQ, Men's Health, um, NPR, Shondaland, Cultured, um, Spin, Playboy, um, that's pretty much kind of the roster. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Drea Donna. Um, it's really nice to see y'all's faces um, from the media landscape. Uh, my freelancing falls into a few different buckets. And for me, it was really important. I kind of didn't want to do the, the content farm thing. So I look for a creative ways to apply my journalism skills. So um, right now, I'm a digital producer at BET, again, freelance. Um, sometimes I edit for websites like Fortune or The Root, like as a temporary editor when their staff goes, goes on leave. Um, I also do copywriting, which has been um, a really good stream of income. So entrepreneurs might need help to launch websites and I'll write the copy for their websites or they might need bios, LinkedIn profiles. You know, I've been really thinking um, in terms of other ways to use this muscle that we have. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kovier. Um, in this new iteration of my freelance life, um, prior to this, I was the entertainment editor at BuzzFeed News. And then um, after leaving there, it was freelancing for me. And um, I guess I cover a lot of different topics. One of the things that I will always say to you is <laughs> do not restrict yourself to a beat. Because if you can if you can write a good story, if you can report on a good story, then you should be able to cross genres. I've written for the New York Times, um, Allure Magazine, Yes Magazine. I'm forgetting a lot of the places that I've written for all of a sudden, The Guardian, um, Smithsonian Magazine, The Atlantic. Um, and I cover every, mostly what I will say I cover is culture, but that stems from anything from um, international relations to music reviews to television and entertainment. Hey everyone, um, Patrice Peck again. I am a freelancer. I freelance for New York Times, uh, Elle Magazine. I freelance for Ebony in the past, uh, Teen Vogue, Vogue, Washington Post, LA Times, and a whole bunch of other places. Um, yeah. Perfect. Uh, and I also actually freelance too. So I was, and I really seriously just started this year, like taking it seriously. So I was very excited to um, to have this this conversation because uh, these folks in this room also were kind of inspirations for me to be like, you know what, let me see what I can do here. Um, and it has been an exciting experience. And I think that there's a lot that can be taken away um, from what they said today. For anybody that's considered it, like you just need to do it, like send those pitches out. Um, and Kobe already dropped the first tip, don't stick to a beat. Um, and I'll kind of throw the first question to you since you said that, Kobe. Um, I think in a lot of cases we do, we have our specialties. Um, we have the areas that we know the best. Um, so would you recommend when you're coming in, starting out as a freelancer, it does it make more sense to kind of focus in on an area that you know you can write well, you can create 
strong pitches for or you know what would your recommendation be for somebody that is just starting out maybe very green to the idea of freelancing and sending pitches out as far as the stories they should seek out and the pitches that they should send to editors i do think if you are very green i think it's important to sort of build a little bit of a profile of what you're good at so if you want to be you know the person who covers television and is let's say you specifically want to cover um, representation and television, do a lot of pitches on that, get um, your bylines in a couple of places, because the one thing about freelancing is bylines breed bylines, like people see your work in this place, they see you do um, this, um, cover this show here, cover this um, maybe album, do a review, a historical review, and then you become the person they go to and ask to do something similar. So it becomes very easy to do that. If you're just starting out, I definitely would recommend having one or two focuses. Um, at the same time, if you're like me and you always know that you can do more than one thing and you want to do more than one thing, I do recommend um, every once in a while, even when you're just starting out, start you know throwing a couple of pictures here and there that may seem out of your wheelhouse because those are the things that really challenge you and you end up discovering um that you end up that you like writing about a different thing so you may start out doing representation and television and then all of a sudden maybe you cover something related about representation and my immigration on mm -hmm. in terms of the TV show. And then you move away from television and all of a sudden you're covering a migration story that's related to a political event because you had that experience of, and you took that chance of like, okay, I sort of know how to talk about this subject in this context. What if I move this subject into a different context? And don't forget like, most of the time, and I say most, and I've been an editor, so I shade editors all the time knowing that I have been one. Um, <laughs> and most of the time, most of the time, editors are there to help you. So most good editors are not just gonna, you know, throw anything at you and leave you to kind of swim on your own. You will have support. And don't forget, like, especially when you're reporting, which is what I always recommend people start with, when you're reporting, don't forget that your job is not necessarily to come up with things by yourself. Your job is to find people and to report their stories out. And that I think is a good way, even if you wanna be a person who does more commentary later on, I think that's just a good way to really build up your ideas about what is going on in a particular area. Mm -hmm. And um, let me, I'll ask Patrice, what would be, whenever I have conversations with folks about wanting to freelance, the first thing that usually comes out of their mouth is basically, how do I do it? How do I pitch? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's really just writing a pitch up and sending it out. But I also understand that there is a bit of a, you have to take a certain approach to be real as black journalists. A lot of the topics that we pitch, mm. the editors don't look like us. So mm -hmm. it takes a little bit more explaining and multiple emails in a lot of cases to under to make them understand why this is relevant um but what tips would you have for folks that are wanting to kind of break into freelancing or maybe even do a little bit more of it maybe i did one um just related to pitching and and formulating those pitches yep i actually spoke with two uh young black women freelancers this week about that um and I looked at the, I looked, I had them show me their pitches that like either had been ghosted or rejected. Um, and I would say the first tip is like Covier said, bylines you get or like breed bylines. And so whether you, if you've ever published anything that includes like on your own blog, um, that includes like for your student newspaper maybe, which should be online at this point, so should have like links. Anything that can demonstrate that you know how to write, I would put that in just like the head. This is assuming you, this is a cold pitch, meaning like you don't know the editor. Say, this is what I say when I cold pitch. I'm like Patrice here, comma, a, a freelance journalist who's covered, um, you know, race, identity, and culture for 
and then I save the publications and then I link to the publications, um, like my work at those publications. And, and also Patrice, when I put my name, I link to my portfolio, my website, which has my full portfolio. So again, like, I guess, point, like the tip before that is actually to just have a landing page, like with your name.com or whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be your name, but just a page where people can go to know that you exist and to see your sort of um, your editorial digital footprint, right? Um, just start with that quick little intro. And then when it comes to the pitching the idea, try your hardest to make sure that it's like concise and not just a super sort of general um, brainstorm, if that makes sense. It can be hard to know it's general until you see what a concise pitch is. Um, but think of like an inverted triangle in some cases the, the top of the triangle is very small you want to just like hit them with like i want to do a story i'll give an example of a story a cold pitch that i did that is has been accepted recently um i want to do a reported article on the invisible toll of uterine fibroids um and the unique impact they have on black women and I explained what I meant by invisible toll, meaning like the emotional, psychological, um, and like social um, sort of tolls they take as opposed to the physical um, tolls, which are more reported on and spoken about. Um, and then I, after, after I hit them with like the boom, like this is what I'm trying to get at in a nutshell, I provided them a few sources. Like these are the kinds of people um, who I will speak to for it. These are the experts. Um, this is the research that's been done that I will use to contextualize this piece. Um, and like Trey said, you know, sometimes editors, they don't, un they're gonna need, I got follow-up questions um, asking like, oh, are you sure that um, those, those invisible tolls actually differ um, between black women and white men, white women? And I had to then, follow up with like another very long email in which I included research that I did before I even got the pitch accepted, explaining like, yes, the invisible tolls also happen to white women, but this is why it's, it's the, the, the tolls exacerbated with black women because of all these other systemic things, right? And so after all of that, like the pitch was accepted. Um, and you know, the stuff that I researched for that follow-up email, I'm gonna obviously be able to include it in the pitch. But I say all that to say, I could have sent an email that was like, I wanna talk about like racial disparity with uterine fibroids and black women. Like black women experience it more, X, Y, Z. But my pitch was a little bit more like fine-tuned. It had the unique sort of angle. Um, and, it, and I basically provided the editor with like, here's what I wanna do and here's exactly how I'm gonna make it happen so that they were confident that I would be able to do that. Okay. Now those are all great, great uh, tips. And I'm going to, um, well, I'll say it later. Um, but I'm like compiling this information the best that I can for this panel specifically um, and trying to figure out a way to share that, post this. Um, but now, Garrick, you were, you worked at the Times um, and he, is an exceptional, you know, music entertainment. He covered just really, I feel for a lot of people, all their favorite artists. Um, did you freelance outside of, and I, I kind of want to speak to for people that want to freelance, but they're maybe worried about it competing with the work that they do as journalists at their, you know, their full-time gigs. Um, mm -hmm. Did you, you, did you freelance outside of the times when you were there and you were covering music? And then also, did you face any challenges? Like, how did you find the balance um, and, and what advice would you have for folks that might be a little bit nervous or have questions about, you know, working my full-time job as a journalist, but then also wanting to do freelancing and maybe covering some topics I can't in my everyday? Uh, okay, you're about to get me in trouble. But, uh -oh. Oh, <laughs> um, no, it's, no, not at all. <laughs> I mean, I We're did, on a <laughs> and I, you know, we can be we can be honest here. Well, I'm always going to be honest, regardless of what stage I'm on. Um, I did, and the truth of the matter is um, no one cared until the story was too big. Um, and I watched 
so many of my colleagues who were white um, freelancing at major places, you know, we sort of kind of had a um, like an open policy around it of just like, don't let it interfere with your work, you know, all these things that they tell you when they don't actually care. Um, and so I learned the hard way. And that was, I had done a piece for GQ that I worked on for like six months. Um, and it was an oral history of Nipsey Hussle's life. And, you know, it was an idea to be, again, really transparent that was not mine. Um, the family wanted this and the family asked for me um, because of what I had written at the Times. And so I did the piece and it went pretty wide. And then all of a sudden there is, oh, well, there's these policies that you broke and there's this and there's that. And I have my guild rep and I'm like, tell me where the policy is. And yeah. also point me to the white folks who have done cover stories for LA Mag and for other places. And when was that conversation had with them? And you you can watch a white editor, like when they know that they've been caught in a whole lie and like they do the thing of like, they could either just say, oh, actually, you know, I wasn't aware or that, or like what most of them are gonna do, which is like, well, it's still just you. You know what I mean? Like when I would have rather you have just say like, it's you because of blank and we know the blank, we don't have to even fill in the blank there. So I, really did know that that was kind of my exit point um, at that place because I just couldn't, I didn't feel good about working for a place that wouldn't want to celebrate you in that moment, um, that wouldn't want to celebrate your hard work in that moment, wouldn't want to celebrate um, what that means for you because all they can see is what it means for them, which is, oh, maybe if I treated that person better, like they would not want to be writing elsewhere regardless of the opportunity or why is it that you want to do some other things and even though you can say and that which is also you know they they like to do this thing too of, we would have loved to run that story and i said in a newspaper you would have ran 6500 words on nipsey hustle you don't have to lie to my face you know like you you just you actually don't because i've pitched big projects and have worked on those projects for a year and have seen the way that there's got to be two versions, right? You've got to have the long version online and then here's going to be the short version for print because we're still stuck in that mentality. So I knew that I no longer wanted to be in that kind of space. And there was some other kind of writing that I wanted to do. Um, and so leaving really gave me that opportunity, but also, you know, I was telling a friend the other day who was on another panel, I was just like, I kind of feel like a bit of a, a fraud, like being on this panel because my freelance experience, um, I think is particularly unique just because of the fact that I'm a culture writer and oftentimes you actually aren't pitching anything other than yourself. Um, a lot of these publications, they just want you to be the one to write it or um, an artist or an actor um, or a celebrity will say, well, I really like Garrett Kennedy's writing. Can he come do this? And like, that's how the story comes. And then you come up with the story together or you have the idea and it's like, well, I think this could be it too. But yeah, like I have been really fortunate to operate in a space where I can treat this as sort of a it's it's primary but also not because like everything has to take a back seat to book work because of just the nature of that um and so that's that's why when i say like oh i feel like a little bit of a fraud because like i i don't have those experiences of like chasing invoices or anything like that because like i've been in the industry long enough that these publications that you work with they want to keep working with you so like a lot of the nonsense that at the beginning of my career i definitely had where it's like and, you know, and it, and it and I hated that it was you know one of our publications where it was just like, oh, okay, so two years later I gotta still ask you for this money, um, but that deadline I made on time. So and I actually never got that money, and I think we all know um, what publication that is. So you know that that's that's why I felt a little bit like oh you know I don't have some of the um, same stories or experiences that a lot of people do. Um, in this because I, I think it becomes really unique with with culture writers, particularly um, at the level that like I, I do it at. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get on that level. Well, I think it's um, good to know <laughs> that there's black freelancers at that level because most of the freelancers at that level are white. You know yeah. what I'm saying? No, yeah, I mean, they are, not only are they white, but they're like older 
older guys and you know i'm young and i'm black and i'm queer and i am 99.9 percent .9 of the time the only person in the space um and you know you go from and to go from a daily paper to now you know these publications where it's like oh they've spent a lot of money on this shoot and there's a you know this whole budget and there's all these moving pieces and now there's people like treating you like the talent because that's like how the white folks get treated and like that part has been pretty jarring to me because you know i'm from a place where it's like i had to art direct i had to creative direct i had to you know i had to hustle the folks i had to tell the photographer how to shoot where to shoot also tell them who the story is going to be about because god forbid they're not even going to do research before they show up to the shoot versus right. like i'm going up to places with whole boards and a whole thing and it's just like do you need some water and what else do you need and just go sit over there and like they're going to come to you and it's like oh okay so this is this is a whole different thing and so that that is really nice and I, i'm really blessed to have that that is we love when somebody is delivering water that is <laughs> you have made it classy all right classy <laughs> um and drea you the reason i wanted you on this panel was because you kind of hit you do you know uh writing like for publications but then also with you do more like the marketing too like you said you do copywriting and I, you worked on the um you worked on like the facebook project right it was yeah. the uh it's called the buy black friday shop right the buy black friday shop um can you speak to how you were able to make that transition in and advice for folks that I don't think people realize that writing skills are transferable across like industries. So you right. can do marketing PR, like there are needs for great writers everywhere. Um, but right. can you talk about how you made that transition into freelancing for specifically like brands, like brand, brand content and that kind of stuff. Um, and I guess give some advice too for folks that may have an interest in doing that specifically. Okay. Absolutely. And I will try to keep it brief, but it's okay. just, it's a number of things and also some of the things that other people have touched on. So I would say that the first thing was, you know, having a solid resume and being really good at the thing that I do, which was, you know, I'm pretty much known for doing media and entertainment, right? I work for NFL Network, Revolt, Complex, BuzzFeed. And so people come to my website, they see these big, sexy names and they say, oh, she can do entertainment. Um, but every single brand publication, whatever, is trying to merge entertainment and build some of that aspect and that storytelling into what they're doing. Um, if you think about this pandemic, like everything had to become virtual, right? And so mm -hmm. people who are native to digital media, like all of a sudden be became really valuable. Um, so one of the projects I have now actually is I'm helping to produce a technology conference that's usually in person, but now it has to be virtual. And they're like, who can be a virtual producer? Okay, digital journalists, right? So it's been a very interesting um, journey just trying to find these different marketing um, opportunities. Um, for Facebook in particular, um, I think it was that not only was I writing or editing at these places, but I was uh, trying different things, like Kobe said, I was uh, producing. So I had on my website, on that landing page that Patrice talked about, that's so important. You know, I had not just written articles, but I had evidence that I could produce, that I could write. Um, my last full-time job was complex and I left that. Um, I started cheating on them to go freelance uh, <laughs> and I was writing for a digital talk show, like a YouTube talk show. And mm -hmm. so uh, I left complex because they were, we made the show, we, it became a uh, full-time like five days a week. But after two months, that show got canceled. So I was like, oh, I took this leap. I took this risk. I jumped out, the rug got pulled underneath my feet. And it's really important to be transparent about these things. But I was like, I'm out here now. So let's just make it work. So, you know, it doesn't matter that the show was three months. Like I know how to produce a, a live digital talk show. And so that's on my website. I have evidence of that. And so Facebook, I could send that link, that pilot to Facebook and to show them that I could, you know, I can uh, write a whole script. And I think it's important to know that everything is scripted, even things that don't look scripted. So somebody is writing you know, things I've gotten to do. Somebody's writing the questions for workshops like this. And a lot of times that person is me um, because I'm able to say, hey, when I was at Complex, I worked on Complex Comp. So I think that is a big tip as well. Um, if you have a nine to five, if you can find ways to get experience doing other things there, um, if you can say, you know, you might be an editor, but you want to start to produce, asking, can you volunteer on a project? Um, 
If it's, you know, rolling out a podcast at the outlet that you're at, can I help in some way? Can I help with the, the, the marketing of it? Whatever it is, like starting, seeing how you can get experience in those things that you think you're interested in, just so that you can have evidence that you've done them. So that when you're out here on your own, you have something to point to. So like Kobe has said, even though I maybe started in entertainment, I have evidence of, because I followed these curiosities, right? So even when I was at um, Revolt, I freelanced for Hello Giggles, which is a beauty website, but I knew that eventually I wanted to be able to write for beauty brands and I wanted to have evidence that I was familiar with that world. So um, I think those are some tips that I would give, you know, um, have your digital presence, um, be good at, be known for one thing, but then also be able to show that you can transition and cover other things. Right. Um, and then it's all about, all about relationships. So people who, a lot of people are jumping shit. Like we know that, right? Because media ain't treating us right. So a lot of people have gone on to, you know, they were editors at Buzzfeed and now they are, you know, marketing directors at this place, right? Or um, brand creative at another place. And so reach out to those people that you might've worked with when you see that update on LinkedIn and just say, hey, you know, if you need help with that, or I think I can do that. And I'm really good at raising my hand and shooting my shot, jumping in your LinkedIn, jumping in your, your Twitter DM and just being like, okay, you know, maybe there's some synergy here. Those are all key, key pieces. And I think another thing that you mentioned is that network. And I, I specifically for black people, black freelancers, um, a lot of times we are dependent on each other to, you know, maybe I can't, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't have the bandwidth to write this piece. I might recommend you or, you know, suggest you to the editor. Um, can you get me in contact with an editor? So uh, I, can you, um, let me just, I'll throw it to, to Kobe. You know, can you talk about just how you build your network of fellow freelancers? Um, because I know some people might feel, you know, it's a little lonely if you're like, well, I want to write these stories. I'm at the Black and Media Day Summit to learn about freelancing, but I don't know nobody else that freelances. Um, how do you go about building your family in, of, of freelancers and people that you can kind of uh, can kind of take that, that path and work through that journey with together? I think that's a rough question in terms of, you know, how to answer it because we're all coming from different spaces, yeah? Like a lot of the people who are my freelance homies, if you will, are people who I worked with in the past or I had some kind of working relationship or I met at media events in real life or were all sort of like in this space um, where we had been working um, for publications. We were staffed before, but now we're freelancers. So it really was based on just prior relationships. And then we all happen to be freelancing right now. And so we're all helping each other out. I think if you're green, I honestly think the best thing to do is to reach out to folks who have been um, in this space longer than you. But also I think I'm just gonna let the sirens go and then I'll continue. This is New York. <laughs> That is totally fine. Okay, so I think for me, the big thing is you sort of have to reach out to people and ask them a very specific question. I get requests a lot of the time. And the truth is, freelancing requires so much of my energy that I don't have time and quite frankly, the mental space to respond to every single person within the time that they want me to. And I remember being a young person as well, um, hoping that people would get back to me. But the best advice I ever got throughout my whole career, especially in terms of networking specifically, is reach out to people with a specific question. Mm -hmm. You really don't want to talk about my career for, for a decade. What you really want is how I can help you with a specific request. And if you want to talk about my career, we can sit down and have drinks for two hours, but we don't want to do that over the phone. So ask me what you really need about something specific and you're more likely to get a quick response than, you know, let's talk about what I've been doing since I've left BuzzFeed News and how I made a transition from it. The only time you're going to get that is when we're in a panel. But mm -hmm. if you want 
for example, okay, how do I get into BuzzFeed News? How do I, what's the difference between BuzzFeed and BuzzFeed News? Okay, you've written for New York Magazine. What did you do to get there? I'm trying to connect with somebody. Then not only am I in a position to be like, okay, this, these are the pitches like what Patrice said, I'll send you a pitch or two that has worked. I'll send you a pitch or two that hasn't worked. And I like to also send my rejections because it teaches people um, what not to do on some level, but it also teaches people, and this is what I, and this is what I really want people to pay attention to when it comes to pitching too, especially if you're green. I've been doing this for a decade, yeah? I still get rejected. And I'll get rejected from five places and then the New York Times will pick it up. So pitching, you know, it's a, it's a science, but it's also an art. Like sometimes I know that as an editor, there were days when I was in a bad mood and I'm like, I'm not accepting any pitches that day. You can have the best pitch known to mankind, but it just was, it just was not happening that day. And so when it comes to pitching, you can't take it so personally either. You really, and my motto is, look, if I really want to do a story, trust and believe I'm going to do that story. Mm. There is not a single editor that, a hundred editors will say no, and a hundred and one will say yes. So you really have to have a bit of, you have to have a lot of belief in yourself. And look, I, I don't necessarily, I don't think the difference between me and somebody else who is um, not in this business still is that I'm more talented. The difference between me and that person really is that I kept going. That's all it is. I just kept going. The day I leave this industry, it's because I want to leave. Mm. Not that the industry pushed me out. And the industry pushes a lot of people out. But understand that it's a game of attrition. You stay here long enough, they're going to be calling you because you're the only person left. And mm. so for me, a lot of the networking part of it is understanding that, yes, be very specific in your asks um, when you're talking to people, but also be strategic in how you connect with people. Again, I'm not, if I need something for Patrice, I'm not going to be like, Patrice, let's have a 30 minute, Patrice is a very busy person. Shoot her an email and ask a very specific question. Um, and again, remember that as you are reaching out to people, as you are sending those um, requests, whether it's an editor request or it's a request to speak to somebody, remember that people are busy, but they will make time for you if they see that you're really interested. So don't even be offended if you don't get, you know, like, like our, all our inboxes are always on fire. <laughs> like it's hard to keep up, but you have to keep going. The same way you have to keep going with waiting and being patient. That's kind of how I look at the freelance career. And, you know, I send mass, many texts to Trey many times a day about how fed up I am with everything in this industry. But at the end of the day, everybody knows, look, the only way that I'm leaving is because I want to leave. I'm not being pushed out. And I made that decision a long time ago. If I, and trust me, there's probably a time where I'll be like, media, you have fun. I'm going to go do something else here. But right. I do not want it to be because I felt like um, I wasn't making it. And there are a lot of good reasons to leave media. You just have to know yours. Mm -hmm. I want to tag on to that and say another uh Thing about networking, I would add is just don't be a hater. You know what I'm saying? Like show love to people, celebrate people. Like you know, we it might look like we're all fighting for the same slice of the pie. Like you know, several of us cover pop culture, several of us cover health. You know, whatever the case is, but it does you no harm to hit the like button. Congratulations, I see you. You know what I'm saying? I've been. Patrice be making moves, I might shoot her a, a little message and say, okay, congratulations, right? Like little things matter and just, you know, showing love goes a long way. So just don't be salty. Like um, it can be hard when you see people, you know, having really good ops and you're like, dang, I could do that. I wish I had that, but just show love, hit the like button, keep it moving. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like um, people remember that. They remember that, especially as they, we all trying different stuff, right? Like we're all figuring it out. So Gary writing a book, you know, Kobe and Matt be writing a movie script tomorrow. Who knows? But like, let's encourage each other on the journey too, because we all just figuring it out. And that's a big part of networking too. You From know? your mouth to God's ears, Trey. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, and Gary, can you, I, I, and Kobe had kind of hit on this, but I think that for a lot of people, when it comes to freelancing, um, you do feel like you, you can feel like you're hitting a wall. 
Like I have, I put all this energy and work into this bomb pitch. I know this story is important. I know people care about it. And either you get crickets, no reply at all. You get the, this isn't a fit, period. That's all you get from an editor. But um, do you, I don't know what, what resources are, uh, what tips do you have for people just so that they make sure that they don't fall, uh, truly fall victim to, you know, that, that, that cycle. Cause it can, it can eat away your confidence, undermine you as a writer. Um, yeah. what advice, like, even like I said, what resources would you have to keep people encouraged even when they're hitting those moments of now y- y'all put all this time in this picture. Y'all going to say no, like, you know, what would you say to, to folks? That's, that's a tough question. And I think it's, I think it's different for everybody in terms of like how much they can handle. Um, but I, I truly believe like, if you're in journalism, you have a pretty healthy relationship with rejection um, because we face it so much. Um, and so, you know, for me, it was realizing, well, what limitations am I putting on myself? So if I am not getting stories the way that I want or places that I want, um, am I willing to make myself feel like that's a reflection of me? Or do I take that energy and be like, okay, I have these skills that I can do so many different things with. And so I kind of had to unlearn some of the things too. And it was like, not that I was hating, but there was a moment where, you know, especially at the beginning of the pandemic where it was just like, ooh, did I just like make a mistake by quitting this job? Yes, these white people are terrible and they're awful and they make me hate myself every single day. However, that was income that was steady. Then now, you know, there's a Mm -hmm. pandemic and like there's, nothing. (laughs) There's no more work. But what I realized was, you know, the skills that I had acquired for so long, and I I believe it was said earlier, um, can allow you to do so many other things, some things that I never would have thought for myself. You know, all my years of interviewing um, artists, I've now flipped that into consulting and working with artists. Um, I've worked on some really huge albums where, yeah, you're not in the forefront. It's not a byline but it's income and income that's been way more than journalism to be really honest but also beyond that it's allowing me to do something different and also something that i'm really passionate about it's something that i'm good at so whereas you know in my past life that interaction with that artist would have become a byline for a story that i would have maybe hoped somebody read but like in reality might have been read by like just my community or like maybe just like 10 people or if it was like at the LA Times by like nobody because white folks did not like the stuff that I was doing and they let me know every time I posted a story. Um, Whereas now it's like, you know, that which would have been a story is now a relationship and it's now me helping you on an album. Um, And that's not something I ever thought for myself. And it's not an extra skill set that I had to learn. It was what I already do, which is by being naturally inquisitive, but also because I read so many other writers writing about artists, I can tell this is what people think about you. And you would be surprised how many of them have like zero clue of it um, because all they're seeing is negative tweets and that's helpful. And I'll, you know, even the tweets that are like, oh, you know, this is a slayer, whatever, like that, that is helpful to them as well. But they have no actual real idea of like, well, this is how the media at large is looking at you and thinking about you. So it now helps, you know, when Kristen Jasmine Sullivan is ready to come back and I'm working with her now and it's like, let's figure out the story that is you're now going to tell, which by the time, you know, Hotels comes out, you can now have an entire campaign built around it and built around your voice and you not get lost in the shuffle because you're worried about how writers are going to receive it, how the public's going to receive it or any of this. I can already kind of tell you that. Um, And that's just been, that was a mixture of me having interviewed her in the past, but also because I'm so plugged in with so many writers in this space um, that I can all, you know, I can do temperature checks and that's like, somebody's paying me for that now to be like, oh, you know, what are people thinking about this? Okay, well, let me hit you know, my network and let me, you know, go peruse Twitter for a while and I can now write you a couple graphs of like, this is the temperature. Um, so I, I say all that to say, you know, if I hadn't had that, I would have probably gotten really discouraged, particularly in the moment where 
um, it was like April or May or last year where it was just like, oh, everything is shut down and I'm a culture writer. So do I wanna go back to writing other things? And those offers came in and it was just like, again, to be transparent, I'd rather not write than to go write this piece that I'm not passionate about, um, that is not even gonna pay my bill or any bill, frankly, because the pay is so low and they're thinking you're gonna just do it for the passion. And it's like, actually, it's not my passion. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I had to just spin it into something else. And, and that's been really you know beneficial to me. All right. I think I, can I add to that real quick? Yeah. About yeah. the rejection? Because, um, you know, like Covier said, we've had pitches that don't get picked up, right? Like you, Trey, I have sometimes when a pitch doesn't work out, that doesn't mean you still can't write it. We have the internet, we have platforms, we have medium, we have Substack, we have like an Instagram caption you can still put your work out there just because it has not been greenlit or accepted by an editor for whatever reason, because again, it's most likely not even that the idea was bad. It could be a whole host of other reasons. Put it out there. You still have the ability to, you, we have social media. You can then promo it then, because you're probably gonna promo whatever thing gets published by another publication anyway, because their social media teams really mostly focus on their staff writers. Mm -hmm. um, do that anyway, because then, guess what you have bylines and then you can use those to pitch to these other publications where you most likely you know want the reach and exposure that they have <laughs> and a really good example of this working out was for me last year when i had the most successful you know monetarily um and, and culturally i had the most successful year of my career ever because last year you know people realized oh my god black people experience racism like it's crazy for us. Maybe we should listen to what black journalists have to say, you know, as a journalist who for the past 10 years has been writing about black people, you know, the, the trauma and the joy, you know, I was like, I'm going to do a Substack newsletter, just compiling all of the news as it relates to black people and the coronavirus. This was just something, a passion project of mine, because I was already reading all these news and I knew the mainstream media, or sorry, I don't want to say mainstream, predominantly white, media publications weren't really going to be covering this the way they should and that you know black journalists who wanted to cover it at these publications didn't even have the resources so i was like let me amass all of this stuff i'm reading anyway and make a little newsletter and put it out on substack um so i did that nicole hannah jones had like a thread where she was talking about hey look at the racial disparities with coronavirus nobody's talking about it in that thread i was like hey y'all i made this little newsletter check it out if you want to it's related to it and in that thread um, I think her name is Adriana Lacey. She was at, she's at Axios now, I think, with um, doing social media work. She's a black journalist. She had her own Substack, and she was like, hey girl, can I interview you for my Substack? So I was like, sure. That interview got picked up by Neiman Lab, and a whole bunch of people in media read Neiman Lab. And from that point on, like all these other people with huge followings then started sharing my uh, newsletter, and it blew up for the first time in my career i had like editors from so many different publications reaching out to me saying hey do you do you want to contribute to our publication do you want to write about this do you want to write about that here's our rates <laughs> that never happened to me y'all and that all happened because i was like let me make this little um newsletter and the first people to put me on that wrote about it and i didn't even reach out to them were black publications it was root Blavity, Black Enterprise, um, and one more. So between Adriana and those publications and then everybody else that blew it up after that, now I'm working with publications that have like really good rates. And again, that that was based off a passion project that if I had pitched that to a place, maybe it would have gotten picked up. I would probably have to prove like, here's why there's racial disparity because this is before all the data came out. You know, like we, like Trey said, black media, like we are the shit. Like we have that unique vantage proposition that a lot of these editors don't have. So if they don't want to pick it up, sometimes that's a blessing and it allows you to use that to make your own thing. Right. And we're going to try to, because we are, again, I was like, I could talk to y'all forever. Um, and we're going to do a couple of questions. But one thing I did want to note on before we go to questions and then we have to uh, roll out um is negotiating you mentioned your rates patrice 
Um, I don't think a lot of people realize that you can negotiate, even if they say no, even if you're asking for another 50, another 75, another 100. <laughs> do it because in a lot of cases, they're giving you the bottom of what their budget is for a story. So do you have just any and anybody can jump in here um, and we can make it kind of quick, but any tips for folks when it comes to negotiating? And I dropped everyone that's in this panel. Their social information is at the bottom of the, uh, the video screen. Um, so I'm sure they'll be fine with you reaching out and asking additional questions if we can't get to maybe what is important to you as a freelancer or something you wanted to know. Um, but as far as rates, uh, what advice do you have as far as negotiating those after you pitch a story is picked up? Anybody? Yeah, or, I, I guess um, yeah, anybody can jump in. Or Garrett, because I think, or well, I'm trying to think who talked. Let's do Drea Donna, because um, yeah. Drea, what are your suggestions there? Oh, I'm bad at this. Um, I, I'm about to pass the ball. Because I didn't know for a long time I was getting blackballed. I was just like happy to have a byline, right? So I was like, yes, I'll write the story for 250 Then what changed my life was I wrote a branded content story, and I saw that the same story I wrote for 250 for editorial, I write for branded content, and it's 1250 with another you know, zero or one on the front. So I was like, yo, this is wild. So after seeing that, it made it much easier to negotiate and be like, no, my rate is not that first little week number you throwing out, I'm gonna add 150 to start and see where we <laughs> see where we could go. But you know, if anybody else can jump in, I'll say um, talk talk to your network of, of freelancers and get an idea, especially if you know people that's working at the places that you're working at. To just honestly, because that's a, a, I've I've learned the hard way that people don't like to talk about money, and also that you will quickly see like. Yeah, it's a very wide thing. Um, I had a conversation with somebody because they had asked like, oh, you know, what do you make for this cover here? And you know, I gave them the number and I just watched their body react. And it was like, oh, what's on? And I like, I didn't even get half that for this. And I'm just like, oh, okay, that's a problem. You know, because I think that it's, you should be getting paid what you're worth, but also, we unfortunately have to work so much harder to do that and to get that and to receive that. Um, so it does start with like kind of having those conversations and they're uncomfortable, but I have had no problem just asking for, and people will tell you because they know why you're asking. It's not to be like, oh, I'm trying to like be in your pockets, but it's like, cause I'm trying to actually get an idea of like what rates are and what are competitive. And so, um, I don't know if anybody follows like um, like writers of color and you know like any like accounts like that that are putting out um, you know offers and like things like that and so so many times I'm like seeing these publications it's like yeah we're offering this and it's like oh yeah you definitely offer me six times that so like why are you like not being truthful um, and a, a lot of times like it'll it'll get awkward because they will pay you the absolute bottom line um, so also try to kind of have your own um, rates as well there's certain places that I won't write less for this there's other places where i know well they're going to treat me right so like not everybody's going to pay three dollars a word it's very few places that's paying three dollars a word but those places that's paying three dollars a word i'm going to prioritize them over the places that's going to pay you a dollar um so it's about me like as i talk about um passion we've talked about this a lot like yeah we're all doing this because we love it but also we also have bills and we still have things that we um have to obviously like take care of but more than that like your time is money your labor is money your intellect is money um all of it is um another thing i try to tell people make sure that they're covering your transcription like period um because that's more time you know i was from a newspaper so like we had to transcribe everything and i remember fighting for that at the newspaper that's like can i can i expense this because i'm spending four or five hours to transcribe an interview and you give me two days to turn this around and it's just i'm overwhelmed by it um so i make sure that it's in every contract that i sign that you're paying for the transcription service if you want me to use a certain one i don't really mind but i have one that i prefer um so i'm gonna just run you that invoice um when it's done but that's something that you have to like fight for. And I'm always telling people constantly, like you have to ask. And I've never been told no on that. Like, yeah, they might not want to change the rate, but the things that you need in order to do the story, never been told no by white, black, 
any sort of editor ever. Like I've just never heard that because they know you're not asking to try to get more money. You're asking because this is how you do your work and you want to be able to do good work for them and they want you to have good work. And so um, they go for it every single time and it doesn't ever hurt to ask. And, you know, same way when you're having a conversation about rates, you know, I like to ask a question, you know, is, is this, is this, this is the highest you can go? Okay. Well, if there's, you know, looking like the deadline is a pretty quick turnaround. So maybe we should have a different conversation around um, what the rate is since it's a quick turnaround that usually bumps you up in pay. Um, if you have to travel somewhere that bumps it up, like, and I, and when I say travel, I mean, driving across town, you know what I mean? If you, if you're going out of your city, they gotta be paying for all that period. Like don't, I'm not covering nothing um, for travel. That's just not, no. And I don't think anybody should. Um, and if you're at a place that they're asking you to do that and they're not trying to pay you for it, then I, the, the, the pay that they're giving you has to be at least three or four times, you know, what you would normally be getting for that if you're covering your own costs. Perfect. I'll also, oh, sorry. I just want to jump in real quick and say, mm -hmm. Google the publication plus, like a plus sign, quotation rate quotation of freelance there's that's what i've done in the past because so many people have already written about or shared what rates they've received from these different publications from most of the like major publications so look that up and i think like garrick or Covier said ask don't be afraid to ask people who already write there like what their rates are i'm a columnist at msnbc right now and I asked a few other columnists, one, only one of whom I knew, the other ones I didn't. I was like, hey, what are y'all getting paid? Because I want to make sure it's in line with what I'm getting paid in X, Y, Z. And two of them told me. And yeah. I told them. And I knew about it. So don't be afraid. The most, the worst people can say is no one. No one died, you know? Right. Um, I'll, I'll drop it again. But I actually also dropped the freelance solid, solidarity, which basically... Um, has its database of what people are getting paid and you can contribute to it and you can also look there as well um it's it's, it's just a really good resource it, you also it's also funny to see what a lot of magazines used to pay people versus what they people not pay people now sometimes i always do that but i guess the only final tip i have is don't do the piece at all costs unless you want to eat it and if it's that important to you absolutely but i've walked away from a lot of of stuff because I'm like, sorry, you can't afford me. And that's mm -hmm. just what it is. Hello? That's a big oh, fact. Oh, no. I, I think it depends. You got to leverage what's the value, I think, yeah. if you're starting out. Right. If you're starting out, though. But I but I feel you. I'm kind of also at that place now where it's like, mm, I can't. And it's, not, it's not the same. Well, because I'll, I mean, let me be open about this. I'll do almost anything for Essence because I have a great relationship with Essence. And I also know when I'm doing print for Essence, they're paying me um, in a way that covers what they pay me for online stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'll say. So you, you do have to think about it. So I don't mind being like, okay, I know, I know you're playing me with this online rate because I know when it comes to the print stuff, they pay me really, really well. Right. And, and that's another thing. Be creative. Don't just pitch the same three publications because it's a lot of places that we're not pitching that pay so much more. Right. Yes. And just this, um, I was going to have Brianna in but like we are pushing the time but just one question that we wanted i wanted to ask um is how do you grow your freelance career and i think this is something that a lot of people probably face that aren't in the media industry how do you grow your freelance career your freelance writing career when your nine to five job is not associated with journalism uh oh i i mean yeah. They don't know, I know someone for a fact, I know a few people whose main job has nothing to do with writing, but you wouldn't know that. You know what I mean? Some people do share it and it's fine. Ed I've never come across an editor who cares if that's not your full-time job. You know what I'm saying? As long as you can write well, you can turn shit on and deadline, that's all they really care about, I think. I mean, as someone who came from academia when I was in graduate school, I was freelancing, which, you know, you that's not unusual, so it's not that big a leap. But I think a lot of the thing with that is being consistent. So you have this full-time job and that's really tough. But I also think that it's better when you're young because you have all this energy. Like I tell people, 
When I was young, I was in graduate school. I had an internship. I taught. I was freelancing. Like I had all this energy. I used to get three hours of sleep a night. I can't get three hours of sleep now. I'm grown. But back then, when you're starting out, like take advantage of that energy that you have. Like I had, I used to do weekend editing for Hello Beautiful. I, I mean, it was. I had so many jobs. I don't even know how I went out because most of the time when I was coming back at 4 a.m., I had a deadline and I had to do that. So I do think it's really, really important if you are if you are in that 95 and you're trying to make that transition, especially, and you're starting out with freelancing, I think it's really important to be consistent. Like set yourself a goal. I am going to like pitch X amount of pieces in a week, hopefully write X amount of pieces in a month. Because that's really, again, I think that the more writing you do, the more writing you will get to do. But also be creative about demonstrating that you have an interest and a proficiency in this area. So if you, your nine to five is, and you're an engineer, but you have a beautiful beauty Instagram, like I'm willing to give you a chance because I see that you're demonstrating, you're doing this on your own. You're passionate about it. So, um, you know, do the things you love, like Patrice said, just. Find a way. You just there's so many outlets that you can do it yourself, and then you can use that as evidence to show that you know you're good at this thing. That's perfect. And yeah, I guess we can. We're already kind of giving like closing remarks. So I'm gonna let Garrick and then Patrice kind of give their closing thoughts for anybody that is wanting to freelance uh, or take take on freelance writing, grow their career. Um, what would y'all say? Be patient. That's <laughs> <laughs> kind of the first thing. Um, yeah, I mean. Yeah, be patient. I, I think that's probably the best I could put it. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say to finesse <laughs> and just like try and leverage things, what you have, even if you've never written anything anywhere. Like we have social media, we have these platforms where you can write stuff for free. You know, so many people are accessible over social media. So just be like very smart and strategic with like, how you move to get like what you want without being like shady. <laughs> that is the balance <laughs> that you you have to find. Um, well, thank y'all for this again. I was like, dang, we need like another 15. But um, this was great. These All of these panels today are gonna be recorded. So don't think you, you're gonna have to just remember everything in your head and get your own transcription service so you can write down all the notes. Like we will post it. You can watch it later um, when they when they go live. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody for uh, Kovier, Garrick, Drea slash Drea Donna, uh, Patrice. Thank y'all so much for sharing. Uh, you know your advice and your tips. Um, everybody, please reach out to them. You have their contact information. Uh, they some people share their emails. Um, so take advantage of that because this is. You know, if this is something you've been wanting to do, these are all great people to, to, to continue to talk through. And clearly they're open and willing to talk you through it. So um, I appreciate everybody tuning in and we're about to roll to the next panel.